Thank you so much, Chris. Beautiful. I did want uh, to mention a couple of other texts that came in um, that I, that I uh, inadvertently skipped over. One comes from Rob. Um, he's praising the Lord that uh, he went through uh, something very difficult in his life and uh, overcame it. And so he praises the Lord for that. And uh, we want to pray for Rob that God will continue to give you strength and guidance in your life. And uh, some other birthdays. Um, is a couple of my nephews, uh, uh, Cesar and, and, um, and Sergio, and then, of course, my brother-in-law, Ramon, who lives in, uh, in San Diego. His birthday is also in May. So we got a lot of May birthdays. So we praise the Lord for those birthdays and um, uh, pray that God will guide in Rob's life uh, as well, is, is what I'm asking you. Okay, I want to tell you, uh, I want to share a story with you of, uh, of the Exodus this morning. You know, when I think of big things that uh, have happened, uh, big events that have happened that we can read about in history, um, we think of the, of the, the big, uh, you know, the fireworks, the big things that happen, even in the Bible, uh, you know, when there's armies or the big Exodus itself. Uh, we think of the big things that are very, very demonstrative, demonstrative of, of, of God's power or of human prowess or just big things. But what we tend to forget or not focus on are those things that are behind the scenes that led up to those big things. And isn't that what life is like? Um, our decisions that we make in private, the things that we think of in our minds, uh, the type of relationships that we have, um, just the daily things that we do that are hidden from sight from everybody else. Um, th those, those daily choices that we make, what's in our heart, those are the things that define our character. It's not those big things. Um, for, so let me backtrack. For example, um, we think of Disneyland. Disneyland had turned into more Disneylands, and then it turned into a Disney World in Florida. Um, but, uh, you know, it all started with this little boy who was impressed with animals and liked to watch animals and began to draw little pictures of animals. His name, of course, was Walt Disney. It had small beginnings, uh, little things that you, do, you, you don't see, sort of in, uh, in the background. Um, and often that happens in life. Um, for example, let's talk about relationships. The type of partner you choose for your life, who are you going to marry? Um, what kind of person do you want to marry? Often, that is a consequence or a result of the kind of person you're looking for. And the kind of person you're looking for are the thoughts and ideas that go into your mind. What kind of person do I want? Nobody knows what you're thinking. Nobody knows uh, you know, the type of person you're dreaming of uh, or that you believe that would make a good partner for you when you're laying down on bed, your head in the pillow and you're looking up in the ceiling and you're just, you're daydreaming and thinking about your future partner, who it would be. What kind of person would you like? What kind of things would you like to do? These small, seemingly insignificant, insignificant things lead to the bigger things in life. And we have to remember that. And so for, uh, for today, for Mother's Day, I want to talk to mothers. Again, my sermon title is entitled Motherly Beginnings. Now, all mothers are women, but not all women are mothers. And so this message today is for mothers, but it's also for those who may be single. It's even for single moms. Uh, it's even for little girls. It's even for, for single women. And so I want to sort of lump this all together. And I want to share this story with you. It comes from the Bible, straight out of Exodus. And, uh, and then later on this, after, uh, this morning, I want to show you a, um, just a very simple chart that I have on the screen. So I, I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. I'm going to summarize some things here, and then I'm going to slow down a little bit, and I want to focus on five individuals, and they all happen to be, be females. So moms, ladies... Listen to this story. Um, the background of the story is thus. Joseph and all of his family, Joseph of the Old Testament, of course, and all of his family, his brothers, his dad, 
Um, all of them, uh, their wives, everybody's gone. They're all gone. They've all been dead for a while. And uh, so they're all history. Nobody's left. And apparently much time uh, has passed. Exodus chapter 1, verse 4. Exodus chapter 1, verse 6, excuse me. Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. So they're in the history books. They're all gone. And even though these patriarchs were now in the history books, the Israelites were a formidable number in Egypt. If you travel to some of our U.S. cities, if you travel to um, you know, other parts of the world, you're going to find a very large representation of people groups that are not originally from that host country. So, for example, um, I read that Indians, people from India, um, comprise a full 30% of the population of the United Arab Emirates. I was a little bit surprised about that, 30%. Italy hosts the largest number of Romanians outside Romania. I used to work in Glendale, uh, California. I almost said Arizona. I used to work in Glendale, California years ago, back in the 80s, <clears throat> and I was amazed to see, and it's even more pronounced now, how many people from Armenia are residing in Glendale, California. And so no matter where you go, the cities of uh, central LA has a lot of Central Americans in the center part of, of LA. No matter where you go, you're going to find a large population of people groups that are not originally from that host country. Uh, but then, of course, then they start having babies and then they do become citizens of the host country, but they're still not of that ethnicity of the larger group, if that's, if that's the case. Um, so Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7 says, But the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty. So this is in Egypt. I, didn't th I don't think I mentioned Joseph and his family were in Egypt for many years. They had died. Um, they had been passed. And now the Israelites, the Hebrews, are increasing in number to a great extent. Now the Bible says that Egypt had a new pharaoh at the helm. <clears throat> he doesn't know of a Joseph and all the good he, he did. Um, I think we tend to do the same thing. There's a lot of good people in this world that have long gone and their good works are forgotten. Maybe not 100%, but we just tend to live our lives and life goes on and new people are born and new stars are the focus and and new leaders pop up and just those things in the past are in the past they're in the they're in the history books and this is what's happening in the case of this new pharaoh in egypt and how the story goes is that this pharaoh is worried about the demographics of his country because everywhere he looks he's discovering that people are a certain people, the Hebrews in this case, are increasing in number more and more and more. And so he's concerned, <clears throat> excuse me, he's concerned about this because obviously the Hebrews had different um, ideologies, had a different religion, and obviously they could make a potential army. So Joseph, I'd imagine he gets with his, his, the, the, his cabinet, the his his uh, leaders of his of his palace and you know takes out a map and he's looking at this region and this region he's looking at the demographics and the statistics hey guys this is this is too many we've got to do something about this that's what the bible says and so that um he is worried obviously that there will be a big army verse 10 oops, excuse me verse 10 says come let us deal wisely with them or else they will multiply, and in the event of a war with another country, these Hebrews might side with this, uh, this uh, rival country. And so what they do is they formulate a plan. And, open, and look at your Bibles in verse 11, verses 11 through 14, actually. They appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. And they built, the fer built for Pharaoh storage cities, uh, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the Bible says that the Israelites kept on increasing more and more and more. They just start started having more babies. And verse 14 says, The Egyptians made uh, the Hebrews' lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks and at all kinds of labor in the field, all their labors which they rigorously imposed on them. So that's the background. And this is where 
um, those one-on-one -on -one conversations, the choices and decisions of certain individuals, um, their mindsets, who they are, what they decide to do, and what they say, um, and even um, their defiance of some of these individuals, this is where all of this comes to play and it results in the most amazing story, the greatest story that has ever been told, which is way in the future from this story. So what I want to talk about this morning is five women. I want to talk about two single females first. Later they had families and children. What about two single females? I want to talk about a married woman with children. I want to talk about a little girl, maybe between five and ten years old. And then last but not least, I want to talk about a single female who ends up adopting and becomes a single mom. So these five women made an amazing difference in the history of the Bible. And I'll show you where I'm going with that. So you're in Exodus chapter 1. What the Pharaoh decides to do in this story. He's worried that there are just Hebrews all over the place. So he begins to uh, do this hard labor and forced labor and slavery. But that's not working because the Hebrews are increasing by leaps and bounds. <coughs> They're still spreading all over the place. And so what he decides to do, if you look in your Bibles, in verse 15, Exodus chapter 1, verse 15, the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra, and the other was named Pua. Now, scholars say that these were probably not, even though these are Semitic names, they were probably not Hebrew women because of what happens. The Hebrew women would never do such a thing that the Pharaoh is asking. So this is, this is what happens. Um, there's these Hebrew midwives, which could mean they are midwives for the Hebrews as opposed to being midwives that are Hebrew. And verse 16 says, the Pharaoh says, when you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, which was actually basically the Hebrew word is two stones where a woman would basically sit and, and, and uh, birth her child. When you see them upon the uh, birth stool, if it is a son, then you shall put him to death. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. The reason being is that the Pharaoh would fear again that what if these little boys, you know, playing cowboys and Indians and with guns and play pistols, and they grow up and, uh, and they become strong men and they actually become soldiers against the Egyptians if a, a rival nation would want to war against the Egyptians. So the Pharaoh has some, in his mind, legitimate concerns about the increase of little boy, little Hebrew boys popping up all over the place. So he has the gall to say this to these two women. Now I want you to notice something because this is going to re be repeated later in the chapter. I want you to notice something. What it looks like is a private conversation with these two midwives. Midwives, of course, are those women that help other women birth their babies. It seems that this is a private conversation. He finds out who Shifra and Pua are and he brings them to his presence and this is what he tells them to do. If it's a baby boy, I want you to just get rid of it. Um, I want you to kill this baby. He doesn't say specifics how the baby is to be killed. Maybe just, uh, I mean, I'm not going to get into details, but maybe just leave the baby out someplace, exposed to the sun, exposed to the elements, or, or other means of killing the baby right on the spot. This is a very, very difficult thing to to wrap your mind around how a king would actually ask uh, these two women, uh, women to do such a horrid thing. And so this is his own private conversation uh, with these two women. But the Bible says that these two women feared God. There is no way they're going to do this. Now, they're not going to be standing in front of Pharaoh and say, uh, Sir... With all due respect, we, we can't really do this, sir. Um, you're, you're asking too much. Of course they're not going to say anything like that. Um, they probably just kept their mouths shut, and the Pharaoh, stern as he was, don't forget to do this. 
You know, there were a lot of Hebrew people living in Egypt. If there were as many Indians, uh, as there were many uh, Hebrews in Egypt as there are Indians in the United Arab Emirates, that's 30% of the population, maybe it was more. So some scholars say that perhaps Shifra and Pua were uh, the leaders or the directors of the midwife association to help birth these babies. We don't know, but you, it's hard to imagine just two women in charge of the whole entire Hebrew population of helping them birth their babies as midwives. But nevertheless, this is what the Pharaoh said. And the Hebrew midwives left his presence, left the palace. Can you imagine their conversation that they had with each other after closing the door and leaving the Pharaoh behind? Can you imagine? What did they say to each other? Were they nervous? Were they scared? What the Bible does tell us is that they did not do this because it says in verse 17, they feared God and they let the boys live. They let the boys live. I can just imagine, you know, Pua is going there and she goes to a, a house, a humble home there in Goshen. And she's helping the, the mom push, push. And the mom is on those two stones and the baby falls out, and lo and behold, it's a little boy. And what is Pua going to do? She's not going to say anything to the mom. Oh, it's, it, it, it's a beautiful baby boy. Oh, look at how precious he is. And she gives the little bloody body to the mother and wipes it off, and the baby is crying, and it's a little beautiful baby boy. And Pua there is thinking in the back of her mind, I can't do this. I won't do this. I'm not going to take this baby away from this mama. The Shifra, the same thing. And if there were other midwives, the same thing. If they were the directors of the midwife uh, Goshen Association, they may have very well instructed the others or didn't say anything about the Pharaoh's order. The baby's right there. A little baby boy. Precious baby boy. Seven pound baby boy. And then the next day they go to another house and another baby boy is born. And another baby boy is born. Well, Pharaoh gets word somehow that there were all kinds of baby boys around. We don't know how he got word of this, but he got word of this. And what happens is that there's a bang on the door of Shifra's house and Pua's house. And it's a summons to meet the Pharaoh face to face in his palace. And so Shifra and Pua, they, maybe they were neighbors, and they meet together, and they walk towards the palace with the guards. I would think that they were probably holding hands as nervous as can be. What are we going to say? What are we going to say? What are we going to say to the Pharaoh? And they're walking to the Pharaoh's palace, and there he is sitting on his throne. And he doesn't have a happy look on his face. And Shifra and Pua both know why. And so they go and... They're probably playing, praying, probably as you and I have, praying up a storm in their minds. God, please help me to know what to say. Help me to know what to say. Help us know what to say, God. And they approach the Pharaoh's presence. And Pharaoh says to them, I hear that you have been letting the baby boys live. Can you explain yourself? Well, this meant death. If you disobey the Pharaoh, it meant death. And the Bible says that the answer that they gave to the Pharaoh, it says here in verse 19, the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth to the midwife before the midwife can get to them. Have you ever pay, prayed for wisdom to God? James chapter 1 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, as long as we're not double-minded, and God will give you wisdom generously. Now, whether this was true or not, I would think it would be true. There was a lot of babies being born. The fact of the matter is, God was with these two women, gave them wisdom. That's what they answered the Pharaoh. Now, what I don't understand is that apparently the Pharaoh, uh, he took that as the truth. He believed them. What am I going to do? Because he didn't kill them right there on the spot. He let them live. And I love the story of these two single ladies. The Bible says this in verse 21, verse 20. 
So God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very mighty. Because the midwives feared God, verse 21, he established households for them. This is cool stuff. Because they feared God and they let the baby boys live, they found great husbands, and God blessed them with great kids. And they had a happy household because they did not obey the Pharaoh's private decree. In fact, this was civil disobedience, if you want to say it that way. Now, earlier I said, and again I said, this was private. Now look at what the last verse of chapter 1 says. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. This is a decree of infanticide. Now it becomes legal. Now it becomes all across the land. Anybody who is an Egyptian, anybody who has red Egyptian blood flowing through their veins, and they're patriotic to their country, and they're going to do what the Pharaoh says, it is actually legal if you see a little baby boy running around someplace for you to take the law into your own hands and grab that baby and throw that baby into the Nile. This is a legal decree from the Pharaoh, now going across his land for all people. So this is not a good thing. And this is where the story takes a turn. The Bible says in chapter, uh, chapter 2 that there was this woman who had a baby boy. The Bible says that she knew of the decree. Um, we can imagine that babies were probably being thrown in the river, left and right, um, in the river Nile, uh, no doubt. And she had a baby boy. She didn't name him yet. She didn't know what to name him. And she tried to hide him for three months. Um, can you imagine trying to hide a baby for three months? All of the crying and when the baby's hungry, when the baby needs changing. Babies cry. That's what they do. And she tried to hide him for three months, nursing him in secret, changing him in secret, looking out the window, making sure there was no Egyptians walking by, you know, and keeping the baby quiet. This must have been a hard thing to do. But after three months, she couldn't hide the baby anymore, the Bible says. So the Bible says here, when she could, this is chapter 2, verse 3, when she could hide him no longer, she got him a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it. So she gets this basket. Maybe it was a laundry basket. Or maybe she custom made it. But it was a basket large enough to put a little three-month-old baby. Now, three months old, what's that about? Maybe maybe this big or something? About three months old? I don't know. <laughs> How about you? Is that about a three-month-old baby? So it had to be a basket large enough to put this three-month-old baby, you know, line it with cloth and material and make it really soft. And this is where she put her little baby into this basket. Now, what you're going to read next, you're going to probably think, this is abuse! There's no way that any mother would do this. This is what it says. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. Can you imagine today? Not too far from here is the Salt River. It runs through Tempe. And can you imagine a mother so worried about her baby because somebody wants to steal it or, or you know, kidnap the baby? She puts the baby in a, in a little fiberglass container and she lines it with blankets and baby soft blankets. It puts the baby in there, and you see it floating down the Salt River, just in Tempe. I mean, what is that? And maybe there's somebody rowing with a canoe there, or maybe you know a little sailboat or something, and then they go up to it, and they look at it, and they hear some noise, and they lift the lid, and it's a little baby. Can you imagine the headlines on the news? Little baby boy found in a container on the Salt River in Tempe. This would make headlines all over the world. It would be on the evening news. How can anybody put a poor little baby alone in the water like that? Um, there would be outcries all over the world. What mother would do something like this? Well, the times today, of course, are different. But the baby's mother was, didn't know what to do. She didn't know what to do. She was desperate. She put the baby in a basket. Can you imagine, can you imagine, you moms out there, you know you pray for your kids. You pray your hearts out for your children. Can you imagine the prayers of this married mom? 
She had two other children, Aaron and Miriam. The baby wasn't named yet. Can you imagine her prayers? She's going with the basket, and her little daughter is there with her, and they gently put the basket among the reeds on the bank of the, of the river Nile. Oh, God, please, God, please, God, take care of my baby boy, God. I don't know what else to do. Please bless him. She was just crying and pouring her tears out to God. And she just lets the basket go. And she can see it floating farther and farther and farther away. Farther away. Now, I don't know. Some moms would just stare at the basket until it's gone. Maybe some moms would not, couldn't bear to see their little baby being floating away in a river where there's crocs and, and other dangerous animals or even snakes. Maybe some mothers couldn't bear to see the sight and they would just turn away. What she said was, honey, to her little daughter, take a, um, stay with it and look out after it. Because the Bible says here, his sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. And her sister, his sister was named Miriam. So this is the mother. Now, I want to interject something here. I cannot imagine, I mean, as a father, I mean, but more as a mother. You know how mothers are. Mothers are just mothers. <laughs> moms are moms. Um, I mean, dads and fathers are cool, but a mother's love for her children is just one of the most powerful things on earth. I cannot begin to imagine what it must have felt like to see your baby floating away in a basket, not knowing what would happen, not knowing if a, you see a little figure just popped out heading towards the basket, which happens to be a crocodile. You don't know. I, can just, I can't imagine the agony uh, that was in this mother's heart. But let me tell you one thing. After she had prayed for her little son, for God to protect her little son, unbeknownst to her, she had no idea what God's purpose would be for her little boy. No idea. All she knew was that, God, please protect my baby. And I'm going to say this. Even if it's a little baby in a wicker basket, lined with pitch so it won't leak, out in the middle of the Nile where there's crocs and other dangerous things are, I will tell you, if God sends his angels to look over that basket, even it's in the middle of the Nile, it's the safest place on planet Earth that that baby could be because God sent his angels to watch over that basket, around it, on top of it, and if there were any crocs heading over, an angel is going to say, oh, no, you don't. You get back. And that croc just put his tail between his legs and swam off a thousand miles an hour. That baby in that basket was in the safest place on planet Earth because of that mom's prayer and because of God's purpose for that little baby boy. Safer than it would be if it were in a little cradle right at home, safe and comfortable and being breastfed by mom. That was the safest place it could be because of a mom's faith in God that he would take care of that baby. I love this next part. We saw two single females who ended up having their own family, Shifra and Pua. We saw a little girl. She's, uh, she's the baby's older sister between maybe five and 10 years old, maybe 12 years old, who knows? We don't know. She was old enough though to walk along the banks and to keep an eye on the basket. And then later on, this is where the story takes another transition. <coughs> it says here in verse four, his sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile with her maidens walking alongside the Nile and she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid, and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the boy was crying. And she had pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. So this is the Pharaoh's daughter. It was customary for her to go out to the Nile with her maids and, and bathe, etc. She sees that basket floating by. One of her maids goes out and swims to it and brings it back. And that's when she opens it. She hears the baby crying and she opens it. She knew that this was one of the Hebrew children, a, a mom attempting to hide her children or have her child float out in the middle of nowhere to save it from her own father's decree. Now, 
You just do not disobey the Pharaoh. Shifra and Pua did this, and God preserved their lives for it. <clears throat> now we're getting a little closer to home. We're in the Pharaoh's own palace. His own daughter looks at the baby, and she knew what the law was. Anybody who was a loyal Egyptian, if you see a baby boy, you are to drown it in the Nile. So her obligation, her duty as a good Egyptian woman was to just get that baby out of the basket and throw it in the river and keep it there and let it drown. That's what her duty was. But guess what Trump's duty in this case? Love. Sympathy. This motherly instinct to love and protect and to save and to defend. You know, I remember, um, I've seen these videos, these animal videos, where a lioness is, has a little fawn, a little deer, between its paws, and it's licking it and taking care of it. And the narrator is saying that the reason why it was doing so was because of this powerful motherly instinct, even if it was a different species, to take care of this little fawn. In fact, one other lion, I remember this video coming by and trying to take it away, and this mother would have none of it, and she just fought that other lion off. I saw the same thing with a leopard, a leopard taking a little fawn up in the tree, not to eat it, but to take care of it. Because of these powerful, natural, motherly, innate instincts that, uh, some of, that these animals have. It may not work all the time. Some lions probably would have eaten it. Um, but this, just this powerful drive to take care and to have compassion, regardless of race, regardless of culture, there are mothers that can't have babies that are willing to adopt babies not even of their own race and culture because of their love for children and wanting to raise children. The Pharaoh's daughter is not going to have any of this law. I'm not going to sink this baby. This baby is too cute. In fact, the Bible says that the baby was beautiful. Josephus, a, a non-Christian Jewish historian in the first century, he says the same thing. It adds a lot more detail that Moses was an exceptionally beautiful kid, good-looking kid. She sees this beautiful baby and she just, <laughs> oh, her heart goes out to this baby. It's, it's, it's clearly a Hebrew. Don't say anything. I don't want to hear a word of this. Do you understand? She probably tells her maids, you are to say nothing to the Pharaoh or to anybody. She picks up the baby and she just hugs it. And she's the one that names it. The biggest name among the Jews is Moses, the man that they revere, the man that gave them their law. And it's not even a Hebrew name. Moses is an Egyptian name. And so she names the baby Moses, which in the Egyptian tongue means to draw out of the water. <clears throat> so this, Pharaoh, this uh, Pharaoh's daughter is, has the baby, she wants to raise the baby as her own. I, I'm, she's going to adopt this baby. Now, it's interesting uh, that I mentioned Josephus, the historian. He says in his book, um, talking about this story, that the Pharaoh's daughter gave the baby to, because she couldn't nurse the baby, so she gave it to other women to nurse the baby. And it didn't work. And this other mom, perhaps Egyptian, tried to nurse the baby. And Josephus says the baby just wouldn't have none of it. This is like, this is strange. This is strange milk to me. This isn't my mama. And he says that woman, women after women tried and he would just reject. And this is where the story picks up. This is great. So you can't leave out Miriam. Miriam comes. Verse 7. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, so she must have been looking off in the background. And day after day, she sees that, other, that the baby is growing hungrier and hungrier, just will not nurse. Maybe Miriam was looking far off and, you know, seeing women trying to nurse the baby and it just wasn't working. So verse 7 says, His sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? <laughs> Bang! <laughs> That's great. She's a smart girl. What do you guys think she's thinking? What do you think she's thinking? Uh, can, can, I can call a Hebrew woman. I can, I can help you as best as I can because poor baby, he needs to eat. 
maybe it's maybe he needs to be fed from a, a, a Hebrew a Hebrew mom. Well, that's a good idea, little girl. Why don't you try that? And you get back with me as soon as you can because he's getting hungry and hungry. You go and fetch me a Hebrew woman, okay? Okay, I will. And who do you think she goes to? I can just see it now in my mind's eye. I can just see it now. From the princess's palace, she runs home to mom, and she hasn't even gotten to the front door. The front door is 50 yards away, and she's yelling, Mama, 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 Mama! And mom's like, what happened? Something happened to the baby, or what? And she comes out the door, what? What is it, honey? What is it, Miriam? Mama, 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 you'll never guess. And she tells her the whole thing. Mama, the princess wants you to come and nurse the baby. What? What, what, what? what do you mean? What do you mean the princess? What, what are you talking about? Yes, I told the princess, but the, the little baby, they named him Moses, and Moses won't eat. And I said, I can get a Hebrew mama for you. And mama, I'm coming to you. You got to come with me. You got to come with me. So she goes with little Miriam and sister, and they run to the palace. And of course, as soon as they get to the door, they just, you got to keep her cool. You got to keep her calm. You can't reveal too much. Um, here's, here's the Hebrew woman that I was talking about, uh, princess. Uh, hello, and what is your name? Oh, my name is so-and-so. Hi, you think you can nurse this baby for me? Well, you think you can nurse this baby for me? She's probably wanting to jump out of her, her sandals right there in the spot. Of course I can, it's my baby. Uh, yes, I, I, I think I can, princess. I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. I'll do my best. And for the first time in a while, she gets to hold her own son. <laughs> I don't know how she did it, I don't know how moms can do it when you discover that your baby was not drowned, that your baby was not eaten by a crocodile, that your baby floated 50 miles out to the Nile in the middle of nowhere. I don't know how she did it, but she had to keep her cool in front of the princess while the princess gave her her own baby back to nurse. And I can just imagine little Moses. I can just imagine the princess saying, before you leave, let's see if the baby will respond to you. And so she exposes herself, the ladies are there, and Moses just eats as if he hadn't eaten in weeks. <laughs> and he's just a hungry little baby. And there, for the first time in a long time, I cannot imagine, because I'm not a mom, I can imagine the thrill and the tears and the emotion building up in Moses' mother's heart. She had to keep her cool as best as she could. Um, Princess, I, I, I think it's working. <laughs> I think it's working. Now, this is the cool part of the story. I love this part. This is what the Pharaoh's daughter says. Verse 9, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. This is a great story. Here she's praying to God, Take care of the baby, Lord. She gets the baby back. She gets to nurse her own baby. And more than that, she gets paid for nursing her own baby. Glory to God. <laughs> the way God can move things around for his purposes, and she gets a good salary to nurse and raise her own baby boy. This is an amazing story. And then the rest of the scriptures, it says here in verse 10, the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she named him Moses and said, because I drew him out of the water. I would have liked to have known what Moses' family named him. You know, maybe they named him something else than, than Moses, but this is what the Pharaoh's daughter uh, named baby Moses. And of course, the rest of the story is Moses grew up in the palace and he was, became a mighty deliverer. Earlier, I said, it's amazing how the, the choices that you make, um, your ideas, who you are as a person, the seeming little things that are not in the public's uh, eye, that are not all of the fireworks, they're not the big, huge things that people tend to laud and celebrate. It doesn't come out on the news. This didn't come out on the news. You have a private conversation between a pharaoh and two women. I want you to kill the baby boy. If it's a baby boy, I want you to kill it. And if it's, if it's a girl, I want you to let it live. There's nothing fantastic. They didn't come out in the headlines. It was a private conversation. Nobody was, was praising and applauding 
a mom that put a child in a basket. In fact, quite the opposite. If that were to happen today, we would condemn the mom and send her to, send her to prison. That wasn't public knowledge. But yes, she prays, God, please protect my baby. A little girl who has a great idea. Do you want me to call a Hebrew mom so that the Hebrew mom can nurse this baby? Maybe it'll work this time because the other ladies aren't working. That didn't hit the news. It's just a little girl with a great idea. But you see these, and the Pharaoh's daughter. The Pharaoh's daughter, she wasn't going to make it public. She didn't go, Dad, uh, I got this little baby boy and I'm going to raise him. I don't care what you say. Maybe she didn't even tell him to begin with. But that didn't hurt, uh, hit the news. I'm sure she didn't. I'm sure she told the maids and everybody else, don't you dare tell everybody that I drew a, a Hebrew baby. We don't know a lot of the fine details of this story. But what we do know is that these behind the thing, uh, scene things that had happened and these choices that these five women made, a single, uh, two single ladies, Shifra and Pua, um, a married mom with three children, Moses' mother, a little girl, maybe between five and ten years old, and of course um, uh, the, 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 um, the Pharaoh's daughter. The choices that they made ended up being huge. I want you to look on the chart, a little uh, diagram that I have here. Here you have a married mom, a little girl, um, a single woman, this is the Pharaoh's daughter, and two single women, this is Shifra and Pua. They ended up, of course, having families of their own because they fear God and God gave them households. So because of these five women, you have Moses being born and not being killed by the Hebrew midwives, not drowning in the Nile, etc. So this is just a very general diagram. You have Moses being born. From there, you have uh, Moses becoming a deliverer in his adulthood. In fact, he was 80 years old when uh, God chose him to deliver his people from Egyptian slavery, as we read in chapter 1. And then after that, you see an Israelite nation being born. They come from the Exodus. The Bible says that there were 600,000 men coming out of Egypt besides women and children. So there must have been well over a million people coming out of Egypt. As I said earlier, the population was just bursting um, in Egypt, population of the Hebrews. And then, of course, you have a long history of the Jewish monarchy. You have the time of the judges, and then you have the time of the prophets, prophet Samuel, and you have the first king, Saul and David, etc. And it goes along to this long history. Um, <clears throat> you get mixed feelings in this history. There are some good periods of this history with the good kings. And then, of course, the kingdom splits into two kingdoms. All of that is bunched into this. <clears throat> and then from there, you have the prophets predicting a coming Messiah. In other words, a true deliverer. Not somebody to deliver us from the slavery of the Egyptians and making bricks out in the hot sun. But you have a Messiah being predicted that will deliver us from the dominion and power of sin and eternal death. Um, and then, of course, all of this... <clears throat> All of this, I didn't put this in here, but all of this, you also have the, uh, the exile where uh, Israel and Judah were finally, finally collapsed and by the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and then they ended up losing their autonomy as a nation. Um, all of that history is bunched up into this. Again, this is the summary. But what happens after this? After this, these prophets predict the Messiah, then you have another 400 years between the Old and New Testament times, and guess who comes on the scene? Finally, Jesus the Messiah is born. This is roughly 1,500 years later after the Exodus, or 1,500 years later from the birth of Moses, is what I mean to say. That's a long time. So I want you to look at the story, mothers, ladies, I want you to look at the story from this perspective. These are motherly beginnings of the birth of a nation. And if it were not for these women, a married mom, a little girl, a single woman, two single women, if it weren't for their faithfulness, if it weren't for their characters, of the kind of people that they were as females, if it wasn't for them, this diagram would probably look much different. And because of who they were, we finally get Jesus Christ born in Bethlehem. Again, an other motherly beginning, a virgin in Nazareth, who, uh, who is shocked that she is favored by God, and she humbly accepts the Lord's will for her life and that she would be the mother of the Messiah. This is an amazing story. These are motherly beginnings. 
a little girl has this great idea about finding a Hebrew mom. The Pharaoh's daughter. There's no way that she's going to drown this little baby boy. Her motherly instincts come through. Moses' his own mother. And of course, Shifra and Fua. This is an amazing story. Thanks to moms. Thanks to those women who had the character and the faith and the love to preserve Moses. And now we get the story of the Exodus because of these five women. So I want to say to you, happy Mother's Day. And we, as your sons and your children, your daughters and granddaughters and whoever we are, we want to say happy Mother's Day to you and we love you. To close, I want to share a story with you um, about a mom in, in, uh, in New York. Uh, this mother, her name is Pamela, and she writes the following. She says that uh, she was picking up the children, her children at school one day when another mother that she knew uh, rushed up to her, rushed up to Pamela, and her name was Emily. This other mom was named was Emily um, at the parking lot in the school. And she says, do you know what you and I are? She shouted to Pamela. Do you know what you and I are? Pamela says, before I could answer, I didn't really have one handy. She blurted out the reason for her question because Emily had just returned from renewing her driver's license and she was asked by the woman recorder at the, uh, at the, at the desk what her occupation was. And Emily had hesitated, uncertain how to answer the question. What's your occupation? And then the woman recorded said, what I mean is, do you have a job or are you just a, do you have a job or are you just a, well, of course I have a job, snapped Emily. I'm a mother. And she says to Pamela, we don't list mother as an occupation. How, oh, excuse me, the woman in recorder says, I'm sorry, ma'am, we don't list mother as an occupation. Housewife covers it, she said emphatically. And so Emily was quite upset about this, complaining to Pamela about this. And Pamela forgot all about this story, she writes, the Pamela from New York. She forgot all about her story until one day she found herself in the same situation, this time at her own town hall. And the clerk asked Pamela, and what is your occupation? And what made me say it, I do not know, she says. The word simply popped out. Um, I'm a research associate in the field of child development and human relations. And then the clerk paused, ballpoint uh, uh, pen frozen in midair, and looked up as though she had not heard right. And Pamela says, I repeated the title slowly, emphasizing the most significant words. I'm a research associate in the field of child development and human relationships. Then I stared with wonder as my pompous pronouncement was written in bold black ink on the official questionnaire. And this lady asks Pamela, uh, might I ask, just what do you do in your field? Pamela says, well, without any trace of fluster in my voice, I heard myself say, I have a continuing program of research, what, what mother doesn't, in the laboratory and in the field, normally I would have said indoors and out. I'm working for my masters, the whole family, and already have four credits, all daughters. Of course, the job is one of the most demanding in the humanities, any mother care to disagree, and I often work 14 hours a day, 24 is more like it, but the job is more challenging than most run of the male careers and the rewards are in satisfaction rather than just money. <laughs> That's what Pamela said to the woman. And there was this increasing degree of respect in the clerk's voice as she completed the form. She stood up and this clerk personally ushered Pamela out the door. <laughs> And as Pamela drove into their driveway by her glamorous new career, she was greeted by her lab assistants, ages 13, 7, and 3. And upstairs, Pamela says, I could hear our new experimental model, six months old, in the child development program, testing out a new vocal pattern. I felt triumphant. I had scored a beat on bureaucracy and I had gone down on the official records as someone more distinguished and indispensable to mankind, mankind than just another dot, dot, dot. That's Pamela's story from New York. So I want to say to all mothers and ladies out there, whether you're a mother or not, you are somebody in Jesus Christ. You're not just another. You have the God-given ability and grace and power 
to be the best mother and the best woman that you can be. And do not mistake this. Your influence is powerful to those around you. So I want to encourage you in the name of Jesus Christ and by his grace, continue to be the mom and the woman, whether it's a single mom, whether it's a single lady, whether it's a little girl, whoever you are, by the grace of Jesus Christ, you can be the best that you can be. Happy Mother's Day, and may God bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our moms. We love them, Lord. They're amazing moms. Father, we know, we weren't born yesterday, that there are moms out there that haven't been the best moms. There are moms out there that we decry as being deadbeat moms. But God, those are fewer than those moms who are dedicated, who are strong, who raise their children, who love their children, who nurture and self-sacrifice everything in the name of love. And we want to thank you for our moms. We thank you for all moms. We pray, Jesus, that you will bless them, that you will empower them, that you will strengthen them in, the, in your name and your grace. Not to be moms, Lord, that defy you, not to be moms that defy scripture, but to be moms that are God-honoring, moms that will fulfill their purposes that you have given to them. For those ladies that are not moms, Lord, you know where their life trajectory lies. You know where they are headed. We pray that they will walk in the straight and narrow. We pray that your Holy Spirit will fill them. And Lord, if some of those out there are looking for a partner, we pray that you will guide them with your Spirit to make the right choice. We thank you for these five ladies that made amazing choices because of who they were. And because of them, we have the story of the Exodus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful, happy Sabbath. We, will we have our drive through for our tithes and offerings from 1230 to 1. And happy Mother's Day. Let's make Mother's Day this coming Sunday an enjoyable one for all the moms out there. God bless you.